Welcome to Coffee House. So today we've got the most contentious but least discussed issue in America, the transgender movement. This book is When Harry Became Sally, Responding to the Transgender Moment, and it was published in 2019 by Ryan T. Anderson. This book was removed from Amazon, but it is still available on the platform that I use. So, of course, what we'll do is go through the contents, we'll have a, an analysis of kind of the quality of the book, and then we'll do a big picture thing where we talk about more big picture topics. And then we'll have a follow-up discussion where we talk about the book, and we'll use some of the ideas from the book to talk with a little bit more detail of what's going on here, because there's just so much to talk about. <laughs> Even on one issue, when you can find it to one thing, there's still so much to talk about, because it turns out that we live in a complex world. Who knew? And, of course, on the discussion episode, we will talk about what will divulge which book is coming up next. So, to go on into the content. One of the things pointed out quickly here is that the focus is increasingly on children when it comes to the transgender moment. And this is despite the fact that 80 to 90 percent of the children who express gender uncertainty will ultimately identify with their birth sex. And these ideas are pushed consistently and dramatically by pretty much every seat of institutional power at this point, despite the fact that it does not decrease the suicidality that is massive in this particular group. And one thing pointed out in the introduction here is that biology isn't bigotry, and that you can have a nuanced view, and you have to avoid this radical subjectivity, which is the basis upon which all of this is built, is radical subjectivity. So the book structure, it will go into hearing from activists, so what activists think, what their ideas are, and how they operate, and then it'll go into some of the victims of these activists, and people who have transitioned and then found themselves to have suffered dramatically because of it. And the author, and this is something that I noticed throughout the entire book, is that the author says here that you should be respectful and compassionate to people that we don't agree with and to people who are going through this process and tr having to suffer with trying to figure out what to do <laughs> in light of, of where they are. But it's better to be correct than politically correct. And I think it did a disservice, actually, to use the word but there, because, I mean, in general, this book, I was surprised by how much it goes out of the way to try to be respectful. Now, that could be just kind of a knee-jerk response to the way that books like these are being treated now when it comes to publishers, when it comes to distributors like Amazon. It could be just a response to that, so that's the reason it's trying to be extra compassionate. But it does make a point to try to be as supportive as it can to people who are trans or who are going through these issues and trying to figure out what they should do about it. Okay, and one of the biggest takeaways from this book we get here, just an early version of it, is that we can't make sense of sex without considering the ways our bodies are designed for reproduction. So that's really important. It's not just that we have just chunks of our bodies that are designed to do certain things. We actually, Our bodies are specifically structured for those roles in reproduction. And it's really important to understand that before you start digging around. And that you can show children that gender norms are not so rigid without encouraging extreme responses to when they feel uneasy about what particular characteristics they want to develop or exhibit and how those are related to the different genders. And sex differences have meaning. They're actually really important. And boys and girls have different needs and inclinations. And women shouldn't be forced to behave as though they are men, which is kind of the process that it has been before we reach this particular moment. Okay, and then we kind of go to the beginning of the movement and talk about Bruce Jenner and the summer of 2015 when the trans movement kind of went mainstream. You've got shows and interviews that start really pushing this, and that was only, what, five, six years ago now? <laughs> but this is when the federal government began mandating these ideas in things like housing, education, and the military. They expanded Title IX to protect gender identity and not just women. And you have companies starting to dip their toe into these ideas, even though places like PayPal will work with somewhere like the UAE and other regimes that are extremely repressive of women and homosexuals, and yet they'll, you know, on their Twitter profiles or whatever, and in press releases, they'll pretend to be super supportive of this particular group. Specifically, especially in places like the UAE and a, a lot of other places, it will be trans people who really don't have a voice or rights and are in extreme danger. 
But the beginning of this, you know, you have this guy, John Money, who came up with gender as a social construct, this whole idea that gender is a social construct, that you're not born with a specific gender, that it's just assigned to you at birth. And one of the things that was cited at this point, and I know we have talked about this before, but I can't remember the context, so I don't know the details. But this, there were these twins who were born, and one was born and had a, a mutilated genitalia, and they were raised as a girl. And later, when they grew up, they, you know, they had all these problems when they were younger because they and they didn't understand them but they were told later that they were what had happened and both of the twins committed suicide but apparently this was some kind of a springboard for the ideas that would later become modern gender theory and then we have an early citation from Dr. McHugh, which is really important. Mary McHugh are these prominent researchers in this space who resist a lot of these ideas. You believe it to be primarily ideological and that it's being politicized. These medical problems are being politicized and it's not good for anybody. And the author cites McHugh multiple times. I saved a paper by Mayor McHugh to see if I could try to make sense of the real scientific perspective. Of course, what's so frustrating about this this whole situation is that people just say, you know, one of the most dangerous phrases in the American language is experts say. People will pretend to completely understand some giant area of medicine or science in general and use that to support whatever their ideology is. But the reality is that it's extremely complex and even with a fixed specialization in a particular area, you likely don't have anywhere close to a significant number of all the important answers. But I believe they use the analogy here of the, they cited the emperor's new clothes and how, you know, the emperor's walking around without any clothes on, but nobody wants to say anything because they're worried about the repercussions to their own reputations. And so that's kind of what's happening with the medical community right now. And when it comes to the trans movement is that they can see the emperor has new clothes, but they're all afraid to say anything about it. So luckily, I mean, Dr. McHugh, Mayer and McHugh, they have got to keep their positions. They kept their prominent stature, even though they've been attacked but not countered in their arguments and studies. Dr. Ken Zucker is not so lucky. He was abruptly fired for being insufficiently pro-trans. He thought that immediate transition for children was just too extreme. He issued this study that showed that suicide did not decrease with transition, and he was pressured to refute the study or retract the study. And he he refused and he eventually got fired. But Zucker used specifically a why-focused method rather than just plain affirming. So the why-focused method was trying to figure out, okay, why is this happening? Why is this identity issue coming about and treating it as a disorder that needs understanding as opposed to the radical subjectivity that's being forced by the other side? So it's important to understand that, that activists are making an ontological assertion. They pretend that it's scientific and medical, but really it's philosophical. And they do that, they do this little switch so they can avoid counter-arguments, so they can avoid having to debate the ideas. Then you have a Dr. Brown who had the theory of the brain being in the wrong body. So there's this idea that there are male brains and female brains. And yes, it gets extremely dicey because now we're talking about gender essentialism and how that's completely undercut by a lot of the other ideas within this community. But the idea was for Dr. Brown that you have to bring the body into alignment with the identity. So the, uh, the body itself isn't the identity. The brain exhibits the identity and we have to bring the body in alignment with it. And the doctor said that it works really well when you do this, but doesn't cite any evidence at the point of making this assertion. And the uh, this author talks about how the rate of suicide is so high when it comes to this community, you know, upwards of 40%. And it's higher than with other disorders, and it's not improved. There's no good evidence that suggests that it's improved by realignment. Then there's a discussion about trans policies and how just crazy it gets. So obviously one of the big issues that is brought up occasionally, at least, is that what if you have people who are just pretending to be trans so that they can abuse the situation? And some of the policies have this said that, okay, you're going to be able to tell whenever it's a boy who's just lying to try to get into the girl's locker room, you're going to be able to tell. And that if you can't tell, then you can ask for identification papers, which is weirdly draconian. But that's already going to be a problem what if it's an actual trans person and you ask them for identification papers, obviously, then you're going to have all sorts of issues with that. But you're, you're going to have girls with no notice because you have to deal with privacy concerns for the trans student. So this could be in bathrooms and lockers and hotel rooms on trips. Guidelines themselves, and these are in various places. Uh, I didn't pin down specifically where these guidelines are being applied versus not. But some guidelines specifically say that a girl that feels uncomfortable with this situation, you know, going on a, a trip and being in a hotel 
hotel room with somebody who is potentially a biological boy, that the first thing, the first step is to indoctrinate them into the proper ideology, and then if that doesn't work, then you have to suggest that the girl use another faculty restroom or a solo restroom instead of the general restroom. And there's no guidance on gender fluid, on what, <laughs> what it means or what you should do when it comes to gender fluid individuals. And there was that CNN report that's reproduced, at least in paraphrase here, where CNN reported that someone can change their identity every hour, every day, or every hour. So what do you do with that kind of a situation? And educational institutions, when it comes to the policies, their policy is to first deceive parents and then try to change the parents' beliefs if the parents find out about it. It does not respect the wishes of the parents, which is extremely concerning. But there are underlying questions that, of course, have not been answered. So if gender is a social construct, how can gender be immutable? If it can be socially constructed, or it is socially constructed, then it's not an immutable characteristic. It's something that has been created, obviously. If gender identity is innate, then how can it be fluid? If some people can say that it's, a, it's fluid, that I can be both, that I can be any on any given day or any given hour, then how can it be an innate characteristic that must not be challenged or questioned? And then is there or is there not a binary. To be able to define yourself as one, you have to define away from the other one. To be able to define yourself as fluid, you have to define yourself as neither those two things. Then we go into hearing from, so that was talking about the activist, the activist position. So then we go from that to hearing from people who transitioned and for whom it did not go well. So people who decided to detransition. And there was one in particular, because there were several throughout this chapter, but there was one in particular who specifically talked about how you don't get to hear anymore of the discomfort that women feel and other women feel about it. if you're just by yourself you don't get to talk about this stuff when it comes to growing up and how to get through all these uh, emotional and biological and hormonal issues that are arising you don't get to talk through these things anymore because now it's just okay here's testosterone take the testosterone you need to go through a transition and that's a really important stepping stone for people to get through this period and this person specifically asks, why are you able to receive life-altering medication just based on a patient say-so? That's supposed to be what a doctor's job is. And what other medical problems actually allow that for the patient to have some kind of a medical fiat to determine how they should be treated? But this particular person who was talking about these issues started the transition and then stopped at a certain point when she realized that it didn't make sense and it wasn't going the right way. And the people who were encouraging it didn't have her best interests in mind. And then there's this question of role, the role of trauma and abuse. Like there was one instance where a mother had passed away and the person who was transitioning was, was a girl and trying to transition because she felt like she looked like her mother. And so that was just too traumatic and they were trying to look look like somebody else so they didn't have to be reminded all the time. Okay, and then there's this uh, chapter that talks about the biological genesis of sex and kind of goes into it like XY versus XX, embryology and how the father's gamete determines the sex of the individual and how there are very significant differences between the sexes. So you have a genetic code that determines a sexed body, you know, to put it in those terms, but there are physical differences and it's all based on organization, organization for reproduction. And those, all the things about that body are functionally integrated for the sake of the whole. So you have one sex that's organized to donate genetic material and one sex that's organized to receive genetic material. And this is understood across species. It's not a controversial idea when you talk about how lions do it or whatever. And it's only recently and in the human species that, that there's some kind of ambiguity that people are really worried about here. There are some organisms that have sex that's based environmentally. So some species of reptile do this. But in humans, it's based on chromosomes. And differentiation begins in the womb and it finishes at puberty with increasing divergent pathways for the two sexes. But there are a lot of differences. There's less limb fat on men. They end up with more fat on the center mass area. You have larger arms in men, stronger bones. The brain is the most sexed organ. It affects things like memory, vision, emotion, hearing, processing of faces. The brain's response to stress hormones, all those things are affected. Women more interest, are more interested in general in faces, men are more interested in general in cars, and this is something that occurs within the first day out of the womb. <laughs> they respond to treatments differently, medical treatments, so that's a really important question. Uh, women are generally better at verbal communication, and they suffer different rates of psychological impairments, so men suffer from anxiety less because they have a, a greater production of this particular neurotransmitter, but they have higher incidences of ADHD and coronary artery disease, you know, hence why men die early. 
actually. <laughs> and they have different responses to pain and taking meds. These are really important things to understand. You know, if we should understand that women are more likely to suffer from anxiety and adjust the way that all of our systems work on that basis. If you try to treat everybody exactly the same when it comes to medicine, then you're going to cause a lot of problems not understanding these differences. And then, of course, you have disorders of sexual development. So it's not a third sex, it's a pathology. And this is where the distinction comes in. So you have XY, DSD, XX, DSD. You have more than one set of chromosomes. And there's this recent push to reclassify disorders as just different. But one thing that you have to understand about this is that amongst the trans community, you have a 41% suicide rate. That's astronomical. I mean, and we already have an astronomical suicide rate in this country anyway, at 4.6% amongst the general population. That's huge. But 41% is insane. It's massive. And it tends to persist in more accepting communities. So one of the things that they always say, and there's always this little, because we're dealing with complex systems, something we've talked about before, there's always something that you can pull out to reduce something to such a, a degree that it doesn't mean anything, but it makes you feel better about it. So in this case, you would say that it's all due to bullying. All 41% of that is due to bullying. It has nothing to do with the psychological impairment of having gender dysphoria or higher rates of anxiety or anything like that, or depression, that it must be a result of the bullying. But then it wouldn't persist in more accepting communities. But of course, it has to be pointed out that this is an extremely complex, you're dealing with individual psychological issues and neurology and biology and how they all intertwine, and that's all mixed in with the way that they're treated by parents and peers and family members and they see the media and the different elasticities when it comes to all their phenotypic and emotional responses to everything they could possibly see. All those things contribute to the way that people are going to respond and whether they're going to exhibit suicidality or not. So, I mean, this is an extremely complex question. And the whole point is that you have a side that's saying, no, it's already settled 100%. And we have ironclad 100% medical answers. And we have to be doing a bunch of extreme things on that basis. And you have a medical community that goes along with it because you have the emperor's no clothes effect. So, but then we go from here, and the author talks about how these need to be treated like any other disorder, and uh, cites some other doctors again. That if it was another disorder, you talk about how feelings are not reality. That it would be important to establish that, and important to work through to find the truth behind the false beliefs. So something like the body integrity identity disorder that you know I encountered forever ago. <laughs> but it's people who feel like a particular limb because the, what is it, homunculus in somebody's brain that's a representative of their body it doesn't include one of their limbs so they feel like you know internally that one of their limbs is not their limb so they desperately want to have it removed you know surgically they want to have it removed and many of them will report happiness once they've had it removed you know however briefly they'll report that they have some kind of a positive response to it but it's not something that lasts long term and it's not actually fixing what the problem is so again, sex is based on an or the organization of an organism. And when you have sex reassignment surgery or other methods of sex reassignment, you have poor psychological outcomes afterwards. You don't have any good studies that suggest that there's a steep decrease in suicidality. And you have to try to understand what the causes of trans identities are. And the author finally says that the medicine should be grounded in reality. Then we go into a couple more things. We talk about childhood dysphoria and desistance and how children are going through this process of trying to understand themselves and understand their own bodies. And there's, uh, you know, all these fireworks. There are all these fireworks going off here. And that at this point, we're encouraging dysphoria when children are supposed to be figuring this stuff out. And then you can have things like puberty blockers that interrupt a child coming to terms with their own sex. And when children are trying to understand what's going on here, you can have these cumulative effects. If they get more positive reinforcement when they start acting like a girl, if they're a boy, from their parents, then they can just cascade down that area and just decide that, okay, I'm going to do everything that a girl does to try to get more positive affirmation. Or like a boy, just in general, if a boy doesn't like rough and tumble play, that's something that other boys do and they just don't like doing that, then they'll start liking more things that girls like just because because they're trying to get that, that positive situation. They're extremely impressionable, so they'll be more likely to do that. The author, the author suggests that it's much more effective and healthy to just let boys know that it's okay to be sensitive, to let girls know that it's okay to, you know, enjoy rough and tumble play or whatever. 
But there was one young boy who talked about how girls aren't yelled at by teachers. You know, boys get yelled at by teachers, but girls don't. So that was one inclination to start acting like a girl. There was one adult who talked about how they had seen their mother get murdered by their boyfriend. And so they wanted to be a boy because they viewed boys as being safer out there in the community. Of course, statistically, that's incorrect. But still, when you have something that traumatic that happens to you, it makes sense to try to find some kind of a psychological refuge. And in that case, it makes sense for that to be the refuge. It's like the boy did the violence there, so why not try to be a boy so you don't have to worry about it? And then you have this weird phenomenon of states that make it illegal to talk someone out of the gender affirming or make it illegal for people to not affirm their gender. So it's this weirdly backwards thing. It's like you can let them switch, but you can't talk them out of having switched. That's the thing that's illegal. Then chapter 7 talks about feminist theory in general, and this is already going incredibly long, so I'll try to wrap it up here, but feminist theory and how Mike Pence was uh, excoriated for not having dinner alone with women <laughs> and respecting gender differences in that way and respecting marriage to an extreme. But then the author goes into a number of feminist theorists who wrote about how it should be illegal for women to stay home and raise children, and that freedom isn't sufficient because women might make the wrong choices if they're free to do so. And of course, Simone de Beauvoir is one of the major ones and said women are just as rational as men and lamented the lack of equality. I think John Stuart Mill was referenced as uh, lamenting the lack of equality for women as well. But then you have much more extreme positions that come out of this where they talk about how a woman's body is in opposition to her because of what it can do, that it's oppressive, the female body is oppressive. Simone de Beauvoir actually said that family should be abolished, and Judith Butler said that the body itself is a social construct. However, of course, you have the most developed countries with the most egalitarian systems show the greatest disparities between men and women. The question is, how do we organize society in light of gender differences, not how do we create a society that flattens gender differences? You have to, culti you have to cultivate boys and girls, and social norms should work with nature. That's how we get the healthiest and happiest situation. And there's this reference to a woman who talked about how she was terrified of public bathrooms and locker rooms now because it created this additional risk that she doesn't know who she might be running into there and she won't have any kind of a recourse if she goes to a gym and goes to a public locker room and there's somebody in there who she believes shouldn't be in there, then her and the gym itself could be in dire trouble if they challenge the wrong person. And then you have, you know, police who are less likely to investigate things like indecent exposure or peeping because they are worried now about uh, being accused of being transphobic. And then there's just a huge list of examples of a bunch of these kinds of things happening, like a man undressing in front of young girls at a swimming pool and claiming to be trans. And the author finally says that the need is to prevent the legal protections from applying to gender identity. It can apply to gender, but not gender identity. Okay, so getting into the analysis now. <laughs> The author, as far as I know, doesn't have any special expertise in the area, but cited what seemed to be the experts on the other side here, Mayor McHugh. And there's not a, an especially robust discussion about their work or their analyses or their particulars in the medical field. So you have to take some of that with a grain of salt. Remember, this is extremely complex stuff, but the author does seem to express humility about what the right answers are in a lot of places. And so anywhere where the author is kind of stridently determining that this is the right answer, you know, you need to kind of rein that in if it occurs. But there were several new perspectives on this trend that I thoroughly appreciated, like the fact that we're functionally organized for a role in reproduction. It's not just the genitalia, and so if you want to go in and change that, you change one thing, and then you're messing with everything that's downstream of that, because it's all organized for that purpose. So you can't just ignore that. You can't just ignore the reality of that situation, that what makes us fit in these roles biologically is not just the genitalia. There's so much more that goes into it. And the fact that children experience discomfort <laughs> when they're going through these processes, you know, like puberty, when they're trying to deal with this and understand it, it's not great to add a whole bunch of new confusing layers to this and try to push them to make extreme choices, especially when you're saying that, oh, uh, yes, you're, you know, 14 and you're having trouble talking to girls or something like that. But you know what? You, you might be a woman. Let's do these very extreme things and say good luck with the rest of your life. And especially when we have educational institutions now that 
are trying to deceive parents and there's no way on earth that that should be allowed that should be an acceptable way to handle these kinds of situations and medical institutions specifically need to retake their authority in this area and quit acting like the emperor is fully dressed when they have a responsibility in this area Okay, and then big picture wise, it's so odd because uh, their own ideas are just not internally consistent and that's one of the first huge red flags when it comes to this whole movement is that uh, like if you have a brain in the wrong body then it's specifically saying there's a biological male brain, there's a biological female brain and there must be a binary because you have to define one versus the other. So it's creating this gender essentialism but then talking about how there's a gender fluidity and that you can be one one day and one the other day or just be neither all days and that doesn't make sense if there's a gender essentialism of course the reality is is that the trans movement just uses cherry-picked stereotypes and says that if you exhibit this one stereotype about this gender then you must be that gender or if you use this stereotype then you must be that gender and it doesn't mean anything it's really just people trying to subsidize emotionally their misunderstood anxiety and depression and of course there are differences here because there's a philosophical question and there's a medical question and there could be all sorts of complexities in the medical question but the philosophical question about what these words mean is not as complex you know it's something that we can easily say that this is what the word should mean for these reasons versus this doesn't make any sense because literally you're just saying that the gender label only means the gender label there's no point there's no content to it so we need to yeah leave that aside and have some kind of content to our words philosophically now, medically, obviously, there are going to be people who are suffering from actual gender dysphoria, notwithstanding the incredible explosion by, you know, 7,000% of people who are identifying as trans now to try to deal with what they're feeling when it comes to growing up and, and all that. But the philosophical question is easy. You know, it's absolutely ridiculous the kinds of arguments that they're making when it comes to the definition of these words. And then there's the evolutionary perspective, which is thoroughly interesting. You have evolution, which has all of these markers to deem some people more or less reproductively desirable. And things like being prone to depression and suicidality is a mark of a lack of reproductive viability. They are less likely to reproduce. Obviously, if you have a, a group that has high rates of suicidality, they're less likely to reproduce, and therefore all of their genes are less likely to continue in the pool. So this isn't metaphysically important, though. This isn't some kind of big question about people's identity. It's a biological stopgap to limit the reproduction of people who are confused about their sexuality for one reason or another. Now, obviously, right now, we have this uh, weird vacuum, this power vacuum when it comes to w who people are and what they think about themselves, because we had religion that was guiding us along for a long time, but we've gone off that. We've lost that <laughs> to a great degree, and we've lost identifying with your country, and so there's this huge vacuum, and it's being filled in by all these really crazy things. So you probably have things that would otherwise be minor, you know, it's like a girl who enjoys playing in the mud or something like that, historically, and you'd have some people who are derived about it and some people who are accepting of it and, and all that sort of thing. But right now, those minor things are just being amplified to the nth degree because you have Twitter and you have Instagram and you have chat rooms and you have these people who are able to, just like with anorexics we saw in the other book in Abigail Schreier's book, Irreversible Damage, where it can just be amplified to such an incredible degree that we've never seen before because we have this kind of connectivity where much of this would just fall by the wayside because people would realize, okay, they, they kind of fall in and fit in to who they are as they're growing up and, and start meeting real friends and having real relationships and it just all kinds of kind of evens out. But now it gets pushed to the absolute extremes because they can go look anything up on the internet and talk to anybody. And then you have schools who are trying to undermine parents and schools that are, are pushing this more and more. So it's a really weird situation. But like I said, it's treated as this kind of deep and important identity question, but it's it's really about just unfolding the viability outliers uh, when it comes to an evolutionary perspective into a compassionate, advanced society that has the resources to provide them care, even though they're outliers. The answer is not, however, and it never has been, a broad restructuring of society for everybody. Just as we don't broadly restructure society for the, you know, five-foot guy, five-foot adult male who's in his 30s, who spends all his time playing Magic the Gathering, we don't try to restructure society and make sure he gets laid. We don't restructure society for the people who are outliers and who are suffering from something that needs to be understood medically and treated medically instead of understood philosophically and then forced medically. So... That's where we are.
Anyway, this is Coffee House. That was a, a lengthy one. Hopefully, there's a lot of good stuff in there. We'll have the discussion on Thursday. Hopefully, instead of waiting a week in between these things, we're going to try to do it on Thursday. Otherwise, you know what? I hope everything's going well. I appreciate everybody, obviously, who still listens to this. I know there have been a bunch of hiccups along the way. It's been a, a trying time. I had a bunch of trials that were scheduled, and then when I went to go do the trial, it turned out that they were going to be postponed because of COVID reasons. They still haven't figured out the whole jury thing, so I had to get ready for those even though they weren't happening. So it's been an absolute barn burner of a few weeks. Uh, But again, like uh, excuses aside, obviously I should just be able to do this period. And I appreciate everybody who's been there. It's, it's been amazing to see people still downloading, (laughs) still listening to this stuff. Uh, So it's, it's been great. And I'm going to try to focus, like we talked about before, focused on the good I could do for somebody else instead of whining about my own, my own issues and problems. So I, I, again, really appreciate it. I will see you on the next one. All right, bye. (laughs) 